Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our fireside uh, chat number 151. Um, my name is Dr. Mazar uh, Amir Ali, specialist physician nephrologist and uh, country medical director at AHN Tanzania. And uh, today uh, we have a very special guest. Uh, actually, it's an honor for me to introduce him. He is my mentor and my teacher, uh, Prof. Yazid Chotia. Uh, he's a nephrologist at uh, Stellenbosch University and Tiger. Gilbert Hospital in Cape Town, South Africa. He has an extensive experience with uh, clinical training of undergraduate and postgraduate medical students, and he has supervised many postgraduate uh, research projects, including MMEDS and MPhil degrees. Nationally, he is an examiner for the Fellow of College of Physicians and an examiner and a convener for the Certificate of Nephrology exams. Prof. Chothia's passion for teaching was recognized when he was rewarded uh, uh, was uh, received an award from Stellenbosch University for the bedside teaching of undergraduate students. Prof. Chothia is an active researcher and has published in local and international journals. And I must say that I'm honored uh, that I was given the opportunity to co-author a couple of publications uh, with him. One of his publications, a report on a randomized trial of a novel treatment for hypokalemia, has uh, garnered many citations, which led to his PhD on improving emergency management of hypokalemia. He presented his work at, uh, he has presented his work at national and international meetings, including ASN's Kidney Week, the World Congress of Nephrology, and the Con Congress of African Association of Nephrology. Nationally, he is a, an executive committee member of the South African uh, Nephrology Society, and internationally, a member of the African Association of Nephrology Research and Ethics Committee. Prof. Chothia has recently been certified as a mentor by the International Society of Nephrology and is an associate editor with the African Journal of Nephrology. Regarding his community interaction, he is involved in raising funds for patients with kidney failure to broaden access to kidney replacement therapy and recently teamed up with Gift of the Givers to support patients with bridging dialysis. He is a regular guest speaker for the community radio stations and is involved in health education and promotion at a local running club. Uh, it is a, truly an honor to introduce Prof. Chothia, and he is going to be taking us on hypertension, pearls for the clinician. Prof. Chothia, over to you, please. Uh, thank you so much, Mazar, for that kind introduction. It was an honor to have Mazar with us a few years ago, and he's doing excellent things since he's left us. So um, Mazar invited me to give a talk, and I couldn't think of anything um, to, to talk about, but hypertension is one of my uh, pet subjects, and um, I would like, I thought this would be uh, an, an excellent opportunity to share some of my thoughts regarding hypertension and the management thereof. Um, the talk is going to focus really on basic things. But before I um, start uh, with the presentation, I'd first like everyone um, on the um, in the meeting to please link into this um, Slido app here online. You can use your mobile phones. You can use your computers to log in. And I'd like you to please um, answer the questions. I've got about nine questions that I'd like you to answer. Um, and let me, uh, and we will, uh, just to, uh, just for me to better understand what it is, if there is, if this talk is really needed. Uh, if, you, if you get all the answers right, we can end the talk at the end of the poll. I'm going to move on to the next question in the meantime. So it seems to be a split between 30 and 40% for the prevalence of, uh, Hypertension in Africa, I see 30% is now taking over there with one more vote. We'll move on to the next question. Which of the following is true regarding a decrease in blood pressure of 12 over 6 millimeters of mercury? Please, can you select all that apply? Okay, we'll move on to the next question. What is the best method for measuring office blood pressure? We'll move on to the next question. What proportion of young hypertensives less than the age of 30 years have a secondary cause for the hypertension. We'll move on to the next question. What is the recommended dietary sodium intake for hypertensive patients? Is it 1,000 milligrams of, uh, of sodium a day, 1,500, 2,300? Let's move on. 
which lifestyle modification is associated with up to 20 millimeters of mercury decrease in blood pressure? Which drug should be added as a fourth line agent in resistant hypertension? And I think this is the last question. A patient has been started on antihypertensives three months ago, including amlodipine 5 milligrams and hydrochlorothiazide 12.5. Blood pressure is still uncontrolled at 150 over 94. You've excluded pseudo resistance and secondary causes. How should you adjust treatment? There are your options. So, uh, the, so uh, uh, it seems like this talk is definitely needed uh, based on the answers, some of the answers. So let's jump straight into it. During this lecture, you will learn the following, the epidemiology of hypertension, how to perform blood pressure measurements, common causes of secondary hypertension, how to investigate a young hypertensive or patients where you're considering secondary causes, and we'll talk a little bit about treatments, focusing really on lifestyle modification. Okay, so this is a study that was recently published in South Africa, um, and it looked at how common hypertension is in our, in our population here in South Africa. And um, as I like to teach the medical students and the registrars, there's only two absolutes in life. One is we're all gonna die. And the other one is if we live long enough, we're all gonna get hypertension. And as you can see there, the yellow line, there is an exponential rise in the prevalence of hypertension as one ages. So what is the prevalence of hypertension in Africa? It's, it, it's essentially 30%. So the wind meaning nearly every one out of three patients in Africa is hypertensive. So this was also a study published in PLOS One. And you can see here, when we divide Africa up into the, the different regions, um, North Africa and, South Af and Southern Africa, these are the two regions in Africa that have the highest prevalence. And this is based on 92 studies over a certain period of time. This, was a, this study was a systematic review and meta-analysis of the prevalence of hypertension in Africa. And what I want you to see here is that in 2010, the, the overall prevalence in Africa was roughly 31%. So for those of you that chose 30% uh, as the correct answer, you were spot on with that in terms of prevalence. So the, the point really is that hypertension is probably the most common non-communicable disease in Africa and the rest of the world. And um, you, you get maximum bang for your buck when you treat hypertension pro properly in terms of reducing NCD, morbidity, and mortality. The main reasons for the rising prevalence of um, hypertension in Africa is mainly due to urbanization. So people moving from rural areas into urban areas, and this is mainly related to a change in the diet with a more uh, um, patients eating more processed foods containing much more salt. Then of course, sedentary lifestyles, so a lack of exercise, and a very important one in Africa is really malnutrition. So this is the hypertension care cascade in Africa over the last 13, uh, over from 2000 to 2013. And this is based on 33 studies. Again, another systematic review that was performed in 2014. I've just adapted it a bit. And I just wanted to show you this, and it's quite, quite impressive. You'll see here that of the 100% of people who are hypertensive, where the prevalence of hypertension is 100%, only 27% of patients were aware that they were hypertensive. In other words, more than 70% of patients did not know that they were hypertensive. And of that 27%, only 18% were receiving treatment. And, and this is the shocker really for me, is that of, that pay, of the 18% of patients that, would, that were receiving treatment, only 7% had controlled blood pressures. And this is really true for most of Africa, in South Africa, it's roughly 9%. So we are really underperforming as doctors in terms of achieving blood pressure control. And blood pressure control is really defined as a blood pressure under 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. And, and what are the things driving these things, driving this 
poor control of blood pressure in Africa. It really is related to lack of access to health care, the affordability as well as the availability of drugs, and of course, inadequate education. Patients don't understand the importance of treating hypertension. And this is an, uh, uh, um, from the World Health Organization. You can see this is quite recent. In the year 2000, I just wanted to point out to you the non-communicable diseases, the NCDs. You can see stroke was sitting at number eight, ischemic heart disease at number nine, hypertensive heart disease at 17, and kidney disease at, at 18. What has happened over the last 19 years? Well, in Africa, stroke has now gone, moved up to number six. Ischemic heart disease has moved up to number five. Hypertensive heart disease has moved up to 15 and kidney disease has moved up to number 14. The point really is NCDs are starting to increase in Africa and will soon overtake communicable disease and the, as the main causes of death on the, on the African continent. Now, why am I going on about all these NCDs? The reason for this is Hypertension is really the number one cause for all these uh, non-communicable diseases. You can see there, right on top, is hypertension. And it is even, it is a big problem in low-income countries, as you can see there. So, as I again mentioned, said earlier, in order to reduce NCD morbidity, if you wanted to focus on one non-communicable disease, it would be treating hypertension and treating it properly, as you could see. Now, cardiovascular mortality risk doubles with each 20 over 10 millimeters of mercury increment in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. This is, this is really, this should really stand out for you. You can see here that for every doubling of uh, um, the, for every increase of 20 over 10 in, in blood pressure, there is a doubling of risk. It is quite dramatic, but even more importantly is that for every 12 over 6 millimeters of mercury reduction in blood pressure, stroke reduction up to 40% reduction, heart attacks up to 25%, and heart failure up to 50%. So really the point that I want to make here is that minimal reductions in blood pressure causes huge gains in terms of reducing cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Now, before we can really uh, talk about hypertension, we should actually know whether the patient sitting in front of us is actually hypertensive. So how does one perform a proper blood pressure? Number one, I'm surprised when I ask uh, registrars and uh, uh, medic medical officers and students this, they actually don't know what this is. So Number one, cuff size is probably one of the biggest reasons we don't measure blood pressure properly. And the MAC stands over here. It stands for mid-arm circumference. If it's less than 33 centimeters, of, uh, centimeters, we should be using a cuff size of 12 centimeters. And a mid-arm circumference of more than 33, we should be using the large cuff, i.e. the 15 centimeter cuff. And as you can see here on the picture, the, 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 the bladder inside the cuff should surround 80% of the mid-arm circumference. The problems with using a too big or a too small cuff is this really. And you, as you can see on the picture on the left-hand side, a, a, a big cuff results in what we call overcuffing. In other words, you need lesser pressure to compress the brachial artery, which will then cause a false low blood pressure. And the opposite is true when we're using a small cuff. We need a higher pressure in order to compress the brachial artery. And this is called undercuffing. So when we undercuff, we overestimate the blood pressure. And when we overcuff, we underestimate the blood pressure. So cuff size is really vital when it comes to taking a proper blood pressure. Then these things that, I'm, that are all pointing out here are very important. Number one, I'm sure many of you have conversations with your patients while you are taking their blood pressures. You should actually not talk to your patients when a blood pressure is taken. It actually increases the blood pressure. Patients should not consume food or smoke 30 minutes uh, uh, before uh, uh, you take the blood pressure. The bladder should be emptied. 
The patient should sit with both feet flat on the ground and not sit cross-legged. And um, we should take the blood pressure in both arms. And then all subsequent blood pressures should then be taken from the arm with the highest blood pressure, not the arm with the lowest blood pressure. And the more blood pressure readings you take, the, the more accurate the readings will become. In general, I usually recommend taking at least two to three blood pressures at a sitting. And the average of the systolic and the diastolic of those three blood pressures is the blood pressure reading for that sitting. Okay, so one of the questions was, which uh, um, blood pressure me which blood pressure measurement is the most accurate? Is taking a manual sphygmal manometer blood pressure better than using a Dynamap or vice versa? And I think the vast majority of you thought, uh, said that a, a manual blood pressure is really the best way, uh, the most accurate. So this is a study here where they looked at the mean difference in systolic blood pressure. The AOBP, which stands for automated office blood pressure, which was really a Dynamap measurement, versus routine office blood pressure measurements using a sphygmomanometer, a manual sphygmomanometer. And they looked at the differences in systolic blood pressure at a cut of 130 millimeters of mercury or higher. And you can clearly see in this uh, uh, um, meta-analysis here that routine office blood pressure using a manual sphygmomanometer overestimated blood pressure by roughly 14 and a half millimeters of mercury. So the, the reason the 130 millimeters of mercury was used in this study is because in the United States, um, hypertension, you can make a diagnosis of hypertension now when the systolic blood pressure is more than 130 and the diastolic blood pressure is more than, more than 85. So that is why they used the 130. But clearly you can see the that manual blood pressures overestimate blood pressure. This is what happened when they compared the, the automated office blood pressure, like a Dynamap, with awake ambulatory blood pressure measurement. So this is the fancy machine that you wear and walk around with for 24 hours, and it gives you the, um, the measurements of the blood pressure over 24 hour period. In this study, they only compared the awake ambulatory blood pressure with that of office automated blood pressure. And here you can see that the difference between the two was clinically negligible. It was only 0.3 millimeters of mercury difference. So in other words, a dynamic blood pressure is, is as good as doing ambulatory blood pressure during the day. So with regards to secondary causes of, uh, of hypertension, I think you all, um, or mo the most common uh, uh, in, uh, a cause was, 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 was thyroid disease. And uh, I just want to show you that the most common, the three most common top causes of hypertension, secondary causes of hypertension, are actually kidney disease. The number one cause of secondary hypertension in Africa and the rest of the world is actually parenchymal kidney disease of any kind, glomerular, interstitial, etc., vascular, uh, and so forth. The second most common is actually disease of the blood vessels leading to the kidneys. So these would be your classic causes of renal artery stenosis, such as atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis, fibromuscular dysplasia, and, and things like large vessel vasculitides, such as takayasus. And the third most common is hyperaldosteronism. So Conn syndrome, or primary hyperaldosteronism. So uh, what I like to say here is that other than hypertension being the, being the thing that uh, the secondary causes of hypertension have in common, the other important thing is that they all, all the, the top three causes of, of, this, of, of secondary hypertension, they're all located in the same place anatomically. It's the kidney, the blood vessels leading to the kidney, and the adrenal glands. But specifically, when it comes to the adrenal glands, it's hyperaldosteronism, not pheochromocytoma. Another one that is increasing in the rest of the world and in Africa is obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. And in fact, in some countries, obstructive sleep, sleep apnea syndrome is actually the number one cause of secondary hypertension seen in hypertension clinics. This was a study done by a colleague of mine. His name is Shiraz Musa. And... Um, 
they looked at patients who were apparently resistant hypertensives. And they looked at a total of 175 patients attending a hypertension clinic at Floteskir Hospital in Cape Town, South Africa. And what they did was they, they found that 17% of patients had so-called white coat hypertension. So they didn't have true resistant hypertension. Only 13% of patients had a secondary or identifiable cause for resistant hypertension. And the, the, the top causes here in, in this study was so-called an epithelial sodium channel mutation, 35%. This would be regarded as your classic Liddell syndrome, followed by primary hyperaldosteronism at 22%. And you can see here that CKD and renovascular disease of the blood vessels of the kidney together was roughly a quarter of patients at 26%. Down here is thyroid disease at 9% and very rare coarctation and pheochromocytoma. Of course, I just want to point out here that these causes such as coarctation and pheochromocytoma, the, uh, the, the patients that they picked up uh, is still very rare uh, because this was a, specialist, a, a specialized hypertension clinic and because there would be a referral bias, the chances of identifying patients with these rarer forms of secondary hypertension would be greater. But under normal circumstances, Things like coarctation and pheochromocytoma represent less than 1% of secondary causes of hypertension. This is just another study also performed by, um, at Grotesker Hospital by a colleague of mine in, at Grotesker. Her name is Erika Jones. And they looked at secondary hypertension in patients between the ages of 15 and 30. And again, I wanted to see here that in this study, three quarters of patients had primary hypertension as the cause of um, the hypertension, not a secondary cause, even in this young age group. This was followed by uh, renal artery stenosis and parenchymal renal disease and primary hyperaldosteronism and some other uncommon causes. Here you can see that the, the prevalence of secondary uh, um, hypertension was quite high. However, we must again keep in mind that because of referral bias, the, the chances of identifying a secondary cause at this uh, hospital was higher. But under normal circumstances, in a general uh, medical outpatient department, the numbers would be further diluted down. And the, the rough estimate of secondary hypertension in this age group is around 10%. Okay, what are the investigations? Uh, that one should perform as, and this, and, and for me, these are really the minimum amount of investigations that one should perform in patients with secondary hypertension or, or where a secondary cause is considered. And once you understand what the top three causes are, you will easily know which test needs to be, for, needs to be done. So in terms of blood tests, we, we would like to perform the potassium and the potassium, we're really looking for hypokalemia as a, as, a, as a feature of primary hyperaldosteronism. Uh, just keep in mind that about a third of patients with Kahn's syndrome or primary hyperaldosteronism may actually have normal potassium concentration. So in other words, you can't exclude primary hyperaldosteronism if the potassium concentration is normal. Then we'd like to do a kidney test to make sure that there's no kidney dysfunction and we can and we should perform a UPCR again to look for kidney disease. And the minimum test in terms of um, uh, hyperaldosteronism would be the aldorenin ratio as well, in conjunction with the potassium concentration. These other tests here on the other side, the ECG and the kidney ultrasound, the ECG is really to look for target organ damage. You should also examine the eyes to look for other evidence of target organ disease, uh, retinopathy, a peripheral vascular disease, and so forth. And then the kidney ultrasound is really to look for disease of the kidney parenchyma itself. Are they small? Are they shrunken kidneys? Or, and, and also to have a look at the blood vessels leading to the kidney, specifically Doppler ultrasound, to um, screen for renal artery stenosis. When should you refer a patient with uh, 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 when, uh, 
to a specialized uh, to, or to higher levels of care. Really, yeah, it's when patients have malignant hypertension or when patients have severe target organ damage. Of course, in my area, patients present with kidney failure and have very high blood pressure, usually malignant hypertension, and they end up with me because they need to be assessed for dialysis. And patients who have so-called true resistant hypertension, in these patients, the, uh, pay, the chances of identifying a secondary cause increases. So if a patient has true resistant hypertension, rather than apparent resistant hypertension, these patients should be referred. And of course, when your clinical suspicion for a secondary cause is very high, the patient should be referred. So this is the definition of, of resistant hypertension. And I'm sure you, you, you will be familiar with this, but it's when the blood pressure remains above 140 over 90, despite the use of three anti-hypertensive drugs, all at maximally tolerated doses, and very importantly, one of those drugs has to be a diuretic. Now, pseudo-resistant hypertension, they are really the top three causes of so-called pseudo-resistant. In other words, these patients don't truly have resistant hypertension. They are parent resistant or pseudo-resistant. Those, those terms are usually used interchangeably. And the number, firstly, as I've mentioned earlier in the talk, incorrect um, measurement of the blood pressure is a common cause of so-called pseudo-resistance. In fact, in my, in my hypertension clinic, I didn't perform blood pressures. It was done by my nursing sister. I taught her how to, take, how to, how to perform the blood pressures properly, and I would get a sheet with all the patient's blood pressures uh, um, on it after she had taken the blood pressures. Then the other one, as, us, as you saw earlier, is so-called white coat hypertension. So uh, don't wear white coats. <laughs> and then the, 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 the other important one is non-adherence to antihypertensive medication. So non-compliance to drugs. The only way to rule out white coat hypertension is to do a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. So this one may be difficult to exclude in the absence of access to a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. In this study, you can see these were the, the proportions of causes for so-called pseudo-resistant um, hypertension. You can see non-adherence was nearly 40% in this study. White coat hypertension, pretty similar, close to 40%. Undertreatment was a very common cause in this study. Nearly, it was about 70%. And then you can see here inaccurate blood pressure measurements, again, between 30 and 40%. This is a recent study published in the American Journal of Hypertension, and it was a systematic review and meta-analysis of the uh, prevalence of non-adherence to antihypertensive medication. And as you can see here in red, the overall prevalence of non-adherence in these multiple studies here was roughly 36,5%. Very close to 40% of patients not taking the antihypertensives and having so-called pseudo-resistant hypertension. And interestingly, in this study, when they looked, when they split um, the measurements of how adherence was, was, was measured, either direct or indirect, Direct measurements included th uh, um, therapeutic drug monitoring. So blood samples, urine samples performed to measure uh, certain antihypertensive drug concentrations. And um, the other one for direct was directly observed therapy. So patients are given the medication and the response to blood pressure is then um, uh, 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 looked at to see if the, while the patient is taking the medication, does the blood pressure remain high or does it actually decrease? Indirect measures are things like self-reporting by the patient, patients who keep diaries of the, of the intake, pill counting, refill at uh, the pharmacy, and then a special monitoring systems that measures um, the use of antihypertensive. So it's, you know, we, uh, every time they open up the bottle, it sends a signal that blood pressure tablets were being utilized. So these would be regarded as indirect measures. And look at the difference here. You can see the event rate for indirect 
was roughly 20,4%, one in five patients uh, were non-adherent, but it more than doubles, the event rate of non-adherence more than doubles when there's direct measurements. So non-adherence is one of the most common causes for so-called pseudo-resistant hypertension and is one of the first things I go and look for when I see a patient who presents with so-called apparent resistant hypertension to my clinic. In this study, this was a study uh, performed in the emergency department of, a, of, of 130 consecutive so-called um, apparent resistant hypertensives. And what they did in this emergency department is they, um, the, the nursing staff or, 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 uh, in, the, in the emergency department performed blood pressures uh, in patients. And um, it was also quickly thereafter performed by trained physicians using the so-called BP True device. Um, so, and then they compared the difference in measurements of um, the blood pressure between nurses that perform the blood pressure versus trained physicians using the so-called BP True machine. Pseudo resistance was regarded as blood pressures by the nurses of more than 140 over 90 but less than 140 over 90 in the, by the trained physicians. And true resistance was when both the nurse's blood pressure and the physician's blood pressures were less than 140 over 90. So in other words, they were concordant. So you can see here in the pseudo resistance, the, the difference in systolic blood pressure between the nurses and the physicians was 23 millimeters of mercury. And and for true resistant hypertension, it was much smaller at 13. And these were the differences for the diastolic blood pressures for pseudo resistance and resistance. So in this ED, the overall prevalence of so-called pseudo resistant hypertension was 33%. So in the emergency department, roughly a third of patients will have so-called pseudo resistant hypertension. This is a nice study performed again by Erica Jones at Grotes Care Hospital. And what they did was they did therapeutic drug monitoring for um, the use of ACE inhibitors as well as amlodipine in the hypertension clinic. And what they did was they, they did a questionnaire on patients. And one of the questions that, the, that these patients at, uh, attending this clinic were, were asked is, do you take your blood pressure tablets regularly? And of course, patients, all the patients said, yes, they use the antihypertensives regularly. Now, what I wanted to see here is that the median number of antihypertensives in this study was four antihypertensives. And the dose of enalapril was 10 milligrams BD, and the dose of amlodipine was 10 milligrams daily. So what did it look like? What did the ACE... Uh, uh, um, enzyme activity look like? What did the amlodipine uh, levels look like in these patients who said they were compliant but adherent on the medication? So this was the ACE activity. And what, what you can see here is that in patients where um, the ACE activity was suppressed, the blood pressure was roughly 140 over 80. In patients where the ACE enzyme was not suppressed. The blood pressure was 163 over 102. And the p-values for both systolic and diastolic blood pressures were, statistics, were, were strongly statistically significant. So the point here is there seems to be a correlation between the activity of um, the, in, the ACE enzyme activity and the blood pressure control. If you're keeping in mind these were patients that told the doctors that they were compliant, adherent on their medication. Now, this, was the, this is what it looked like for amlodipine. And you can see here in patients who were in steady state, where the levels were regarded as acceptable, the blood pressure was 140 over 84. In, in, in this intermediate group, where, the, where, where it was below the acceptable range, but it was still detectable, this was the blood pressure, 160 over 90. And in where it was completely undetectable in blood, it was 166 over 104. And the p-values for the systolic and diastolic blood pressures, again, were strongly significant for amlodipine. 
Now, for those of you who don't know, amlodipine is a very fat soluble drug and has a very large volume of distribution. So even if a patient stops using it for one week, there should still be something detectable in the blood after not taking the medication for one week. So in these patients who said, yes, they were taking the medication and had these blood pressures, they actually stopped taking the medication a week or more ago. Now, this is a, this is a landmark trial. It's called the SPRINT trial. And it was a study in elderly patients six, uh, above the age of 60 who were randomized to standard blood pressure uh, um, targets of uh, less than 140 systolic versus more intensive blood pressure targets of 120. And what I want you to, to, to see here in patients that were randomized to the intensive group, where they achieved blood pressure, systolic blood pressures of 120, what I want you to see is this here. In the standard group, in the standard treatment group, patients required an average of two drugs to achieve blood pressure control. And in the intensive group, they needed three drugs. So really, when patients are using three drugs or two drugs and their blood pressures are not controlled, for me, it is a telltale sign that they are not actually adherent to their medication. Um, this is uh, an important study. This was uh, the characteristics and outcomes of patients with so-called hypertensive urgency. So the definition of hypertensive urgency in this study was a blood pressure of more than 180 over 110 without evidence of acute target organ damage. And what they looked at was they wanted to know in patients that are diagnosed with a hypertensive urgency, is there a difference in major adverse cardiovascular events? That is what MACE stands for, major adverse cardiovascular events in and what, they, what these uh, major adverse cardiovascular events were were strokes and acute coronary syndromes. They wanted to know, is there a difference in the uh, prevalence of these or the incidence of these maces if a patient is hospitalized versus the patient is sent home? And this year, uh, you can see here that the maces at day seven was not statistically significant, not statistically significant. At 30 days, up to 30 days, there was it was not statistically significant again. And up to six months, it was not statistically significant. So there's no difference in the major at um, in the major uh, um, adverse cardiovascular events, whether a patient is hospitalized with a hypertensive urgency versus whether a patient uh, is sent home and followed up as an outpatient to, to check blood pressure control. Okay, so I'm going to change gear now and we're going to move on to treatments. And I'm just going to spend the, the really treatment of hypertension is, is these two things, it's lifestyle and drugs. And the one that I want to spend some time on is lifestyle changes. The reason I want to do this, this is the thing that I spend most of my time with on when I, when I consult patients is the lifestyle changes. When we have busy clinics, we tend to quickly run through lifestyle changes and focus on the drugs. I always say it's easy to pop a pill, but to change your lifestyle is difficult. And you need to educate your patients well regarding what they can do with their lifestyle in order to improve blood pressure control. So in other words, spend more time speaking to your patients about their lifestyle. So. These are the things that we can do. We can ask patients to reduce their dietary salt intake. We can tell patients to exercise. Weight reduction or control is important and avoiding some over-the-counter medications that can worsen blood pressure, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and flu medication. But I want to go into a bit more into the detail of the lifestyle modifications. So these are the drugs I've, I've just um, highlighted the, the commonly used drugs that can potentially worsen uh, a, a blood pressure or NSAIDs, oral contraceptives, some pathomimetics. Um, here it's really your flu medications, alcohol, amphetamines. In, in Cape Town, there's a drug called TUC, which, which are methamphetamines, which people, which, which are abused by many 
people living in um, our area, and they tip and they frequently present with malignant hypertension and kidney failure. Certain antidepressants and of course glucocorticoids. For those of you that are nephrologists, you will be well aware about cyclosporin and TAC and, and erythropoietin as well. So this is the recommended um, intake of salt. The dotted line here is for the general population and the, and the solid line here is what is recommended for hypertensives. So import, and this is this bar, the blue bars here is for Americans and their daily salt intake. You can see that they are consuming roughly 3,400 milligrams of sodium daily, way above the recommended uh, daily allowance of 2,300 milligrams. Of course, for hypertensives, that would be just too much. So 2,300 milligrams, which is this dotted line here, that is the equivalent of a level teaspoon of salt. The, the 1,500 milligrams of sodium is actually the equivalent of three quarters of a teaspoon. So you, when I speak to my patients, I don't tell them the 1,500 and the 2,300. I speak to them in terms of teaspoons. They, they will better understand uh, that than when you tell them these numbers. So I usually tell my hypertensive patients they should at least try to target a level teaspoon or less. This is the effect of hypertension and, 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 and salt intake above the recommended allowance. So this is excess deaths due to hypertension through the effects of sodium intake. And you can see here, this is a study performed in South Africa. You can see that excess deaths due to uh, sodium intake due to ischemic heart disease is roughly 30%. Hemorrhagic strokes, 23% uh, for males and females. Hypertensive heart disease. These are huge numbers in terms of um, the effect of sodium and its contribution to excess deaths um, in, in the South African population. And you can see it has remained relatively stable over the period of these studies, over, the, over, over that 12 year period. It hasn't changed. Now, this is an interesting study. It's an old study. It's called the Intersalt study. And it was performed on Yanomamo Indians in um, the, um, that these are uh, uh, Indians living in the Amazon in South America, completely cut off from the Western world. So in other words, they still hunt for food, they still eat um, food that they grow themselves or, or find in the forests of the Amazon. They are completely cut off from the Western world. And you can see in this study, um, there was a, there is an association in terms of the more salt we consume, the, the they consume, the there was an increase in the systolic blood pressure. So there is this relationship, a linear relationship between more salt, higher blood, higher systolic blood pressure. Now the red line here represents the Yanomamo Indians' blood pressures, and you can see here the blood pressure were roughly ninety five over sixty four. I think it was 60, 61 or sixty four. Um, and these were the other competitor groups that they had. Not bad, I must say. These other groups, the Papua, uh, Papua New Guinea, Kenya, and so on, these blood pressures were not bad. But the Yanomamo Indians really had the lowest blood pressures in this study. Now, if you remember my very first slide about how common is hypertension is and my comment about if we live long enough, we're all going to get hypertension there was a, an exponential rise in the blood pressure as we age. But look at this, uh, the graph of these uh, 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 patients or these people, the Yanomamo Indians, over their lifespan. You can see here that a person between the ages of 50 and 60 has a blood pressure identical to that of a 20 to 29 year old. In other words, their blood pressures don't increase as they age, which is phenomenal. And this is what um, they found when they compared sodium intake between all these centers. And I've highlighted the Yanomamo Indians. You can see here, and this is really phenomenal, is that in 24-hour urine sample, 
the, they was, there was less than one millimole of sodium in the urine. Importantly, I want you to see here, hypertensive individuals, zero. None of the patients were hypertensive. And this was the average blood pressure, 95 over 61. And this was very interesting. It says here, what happens to the blood pressure over a 10 year, for every 10 years? What, what this tells you is that the blood pressure decreases by minus 1,1 millimeters of mercury as the people get older. This is really phenomenal. So this is what the 24-hour urine samples look like. So you can see here 26 Indians. They took 26 of the Yamunamo Yamun Yamun Indians. They did 24-hour urine samples, and they looked at sodium, potassium, and chloride. The control group in this study, the eight people here, were actually the investigators of the study themselves. They used themselves as controls. And what you can see here is, as I showed you earlier, the sodium concentration in the urine was one millimole per liter, compared to the control group of 104. However, the potassium concentrations in the urine was 152, compared to the control group, where it was only 38. So, what were these uh, uh, Yanomamo Indians eating? They're not eating processed foods. They're not on a Western diet. That's really the model of the story. What they are eating, they are mainly eating potassium-containing foods. And these are really fruits and vegetables and plants um, growing in the, in the Amazon jungle. So this year is what I like to refer to as or, or is actually commonly referred to as the indiscretionary diet. It's a staple food in South Africa. It is only, it is the second most common food eaten after maize in South Africa, and this is bread. The rough, the, the, rough, the average intake of, of bread in South Africa is like roughly three slices of bread a day. However, the bread contains a lot of so a lot of sodium. And this is just uh, a, a packet of bread, the, the um, content. I just took a picture of this in my, my home here. And you can see here that every 100 grams of, of, of bread has 378 milligrams of sodium. So that is roughly 100 milligrams of sodium per slice. That is quite a lot of sodium. And it's a staple diet in South Africa. And this is something, I don't know what it is like with the rest of Africa, but in South Africa, as I mentioned, it's a staple diet. And I've had patients who eat half loaves of bread with resistant hypertension and simply changing their sodium intake, reducing their bread intake and other sodium containing foods actually improves blood pressure control. Okay. How much exercise is regarded as, as, as a, 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 you know, enough in terms of reducing blood pressure? So this is a nice study, and there seems to be a dose response. You can see here, this study was, really, was only performed over a two-month period, and the participants in the study did both aerobic exercise as well as conditioning or strength training, and it was only performed at 50% of the VO2 maximum. And you can see that over, after two months of doing the, uh, this uh, um, exercise, the, the more exercise that was performed by the, by the participants, the greater the reduction in the systolic blood pressure. This is diastolic blood pressure. There is some response in terms of reduction, but you can see here that it uh, uh, um, exercise of moderate amount is associated with a dose response. The more exercise you do, combination of card card aerobic and strength training will result in a huge reductions in blood pressure. You can see here in this group here, 15 millimeters of mercury reduction in blood pressure, which is as good as some of the best antihypertensives we have available. Just in general, it is recommended that um, hypertensive or, or, or not just hypertensive, everyone that you perform 150 minutes of exercise a week and or, or 30 minutes of exercise five times a week.
So what is the expected blood pressure reduction with lifestyle changes? So you can see here weight loss of, up, of every 10 kilograms of weight loss is associated with up to 20 millimeters of mercury reduction in blood pressure. Salt restriction up to eight, moderate alcohol consumption up to four, and exercise here up to nine or 10. And importantly, for every lifestyle modification utilized by the patient, it is cumulative. So in other words, if the patient loses 10 kilograms and loses an average 10 millimeters of mercury, plus they reduce their salt intake, plus they do exercise, it will be 10 plus eight plus nine reduction in blood pressure. So it's cumulative. Okay, again, a shift in gear, and we'll quickly talk about drugs used for the treatment of hypertension. So again, our 2014 South African Hypertension Guidelines recommends that in patients with uncomplicated hypertension, primary or essential hypertension, these are the drugs that one can use or should use either an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, a calcium channel blocker, or a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic. In this study, this was done by some of, the, some of these authors you may know, uh, Bongani Mayosi, the late Bongani Mayosi, and Ike Okpechi, um, Brian Rayner, all from South Africa. They did a randomized control trial. It was a multi-national um, study in Africa where they took patients, uh, black patients with uncomplicated primary hypertension, and they randomized them to one of three arms, either perindopril plus a thiazide, amlodipine plus perindopril, or amlodipine plus hydrochlorothiazide. And you can see that the best combination for reducing blood pressure in, this in, in, in black patients from Africa is really amlodipine and hydrochlorothiazide. Amlodipine and perindopril had similar effects in terms of blood pressure reduction at six months. Just to let you know that in the study, blood pressure was taken using 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So it, the gold standard was used for measuring blood pressure. In my practice, I tend to start all my black patients on amlodipine and a thiazide diuretic. In this study, you can see here various, this is the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. This is the effect of various antihypertensives at half the dose. This is the reduction in the blood pressure in millimeters of mercury here and standard doses and twice the dose. And I just want to bring you to the last column over here. They compared the reduction in blood pressure when you use half the standard dose versus the standard dose. And you can see here, that 22%, um, you only uh, increase in 22% when you double the dose. In other words, 80% of blood pressure reduction is actually on half the dose. So for that question that I asked earlier, do you increase the amlodipine dose? Do you increase the thiazide dose? Or do you add an in inalopril? The answer is really, we, should, we shouldn't wait and increase uh, um, doses. You're not going to gain much more in terms of blood pressure control by simply increasing the doses of existing antihypertensives. We should be more um, aggressive in terms of adding an additional antihypertensive. In, this, in, in the case that I showed you, it, it was in Alipro. Of course, one is always concerned about when you add more medication to a patient's regimen because um, the more drugs a patient uses, the less adherent they are. But um, I don't know if this is available in, 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 in Tanzania, uh, a mother, but um, single pill drug combinations can overcome the number of pills that patients need to utilize. But of course, a single pill drug combinations are expensive and may not be freely available. So really I want this to, to get into is that don't waste time increasing doses. Make sure that the patient is adherent and if they are, add the next drug as quickly as possible. As you saw there, one of the main causes for so-called pseudo-resistant hypertension was under treatment. The problem is when you increase the doses, 
you don't gain much more in terms of blood pressure control. But what does happen is you increase the side effects of, that the patients may experience. So as you can see here, half the dose, these are the side effects versus the full dose. There's an exponential rise in the side effect when one uses full doses. So for example, amlodipine 5 milligrams to 10 milligrams, uh, common side effects, amlodipine ankles or edema, constipation in males, erectile dysfunction. Uh, in terms of thiazide diuretics, it would be all the metabolic complications, etc. The only class of drugs where the, where it's un, where the side effects are unrelated to <clears throat> an increase in the dose is are your ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So, of course, an ACE cough can occur on half the dose. Angioneurotic edema can occur on half the dose. So, with the exception of ACE inhibitors and ARBs, <clears throat> the remaining drugs, side effect profiles, side effects increase. And patients are very reluctant to take drugs for a disease which is not tangible or visible with the eye. And if a drug is going to cause side effects, it will result in non-adherence. Uh, this is a landmark trial. <clears throat> it's the so-called Pathway 2 trial. And they compared the addition of spironolactone or bisoprolol or doxazosin or placebo as a fourth line agent in patients who had so-called resistant hypertension. And what they found was that spironolactone at doses between 25 and 50 milligrams was the superior drug in terms of reducing blood pressure in patients with true resistant hypertension um, as the fourth line agent. Beta blockers, this is a, a Cochrane review. <clears throat> And um, it was published in 2017. And what I really want in patients who have primary uncomplicated hypertension, you can see here the effect of beta blockers in this study. 70% of the patients were using atenolol as the beta blocker. And you can see here beta blockers were no better than placebo in terms of mortality. In other words, Beta blockers are no, are, are no better than taking nothing for mortality reduction. Of course, if a patient has other indications for beta blockers, such as atrial fibrillation or heart failure, um, then beta blockers are indicated for, for the management of those conditions. But, in, but when it's for uncomplicated hypertension, it really has no effect on reducing mortality. And then finally, um, a frequent thing that I uh, um, see in my patients when they come to my clinic, they get there early in the morning, they have to stand up four o'clock in the morning to get to my clinic. And as a consequence, they don't eat something and they, they therefore, because they don't eat something, they don't take the antihypertensive medication. And I've actually told some of my patients that many of the antihypertensives are best taken on an empty stomach. So um, there is this myth that patients must take medication, must eat something first before they use their antihypertensive medication. And I've actually told them to, it's best taken on an empty stomach in order to reduce blood pressure. Okay, so some take home messages. Number one, a third of Africans are hypertensive. In other words, one out of three uh, um, African patients are hypertensive. It is the most common risk factor for non-communicable disease, such as cardiovascular disease, kidney disease. And therefore, if you want to get maximum bang for your buck in terms of reducing NCD prevalence and incidence, you will learn to treat blood pressure correctly. Number two, small reductions in blood pressure is associated with large reductions in cardiovascular disease. So it, it, it really, you get so much for so little. So um, it is something that we need to improve overall on the African continent. If possible, I would highly recommend that automated office blood pressures are used rather than manual sphygmomanometers. Of course, if you're going to use man, uh, uh, manual sphygmomanometers, you have to take blood pressure correctly.
The most common secondary cause of hypertension in Africa and the rest of the world is kidney disease. So when you are investigate, investigating your patients for, kid, for, for a secondary cause, the first thing that you should do is do a urine dipsticks and a creatinine. Lifestyle changes are effective in improving blood pressure control. And again, as I've mentioned earlier, we need to spend more time talking to our patients. And we need to educate our patients on lifestyle changes. I spend more time talking to my patients about lifestyle changes and less time talking to them about the drugs that they are taking. And when a patient is first diagnosed with hypertension, um, that is primary, these are the three groups of uh, classes of antihypertensives which one can use. As I've shown, the best combination in black Africans are really calcium channel blockers um, along with the diuretic in uh, thiazide diuretics. And in patients with true resistant hypertension, the, the, the preferred um, fourth line agent is uh, uh, spironolactone. Keep in mind the three things that you must rule out before you diagnose resistant hypertension is did you take the blood pressure properly? Does this patient have white coat hypertension? And is the patient adherent to the medication? Adherence for me is one of the most common causes of so-called uh, um, pseudo-resistant hypertension. And that's one of the first things I go and look for um, when, I, when a patient comes to my clinic with resistant hypertension. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for that eloquent presentation. And I must say that we had more than 150 participants. So I'm glad that uh, many people joined and they gained uh, quite a bit from your presentation. Uh, so maybe before I take questions, uh, I would like to answer your question about combination uh, pills, single pill combination therapy. So it is available uh, in Tanzania and there are various uh, pills in combination. Uh, some of them obviously are available in the state and private sector and some of them are only available in the private sector because of the, of the price, especially the newer um, uh, tablets. But they are available and uh, we tend to prescribe them uh, before we try and you know add more more medication on top. So maybe if I can ask you a couple of questions then we can go to the audience. Uh, my first question is with regards to a workup of secondary hypertension, is there any prerequisite for doing a renin aldo uh, ratio? So say for example, if a patient has got resistant hypertension and maybe is on four drugs, uh, is there a prerequisite to kind of do that uh, test uh, before you, you kind of do it? I believe that it's a fairly extensive test and I would assume that it's even more extensive on our side. So uh, before doing the test, should we be taking any sort of uh, precautions? No, of course. My uh, second, good. Yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. second yeah. question. And my second, and my second question is with regards to diet. So, I mean, salt is something that is uh, available in everything. And most yes. of our processed foods have got salt, sodium chloride. But what is your opinion on using salt alternatives, things like potassium chloride, as a replacement for the usual sodium chloride? Is it something that we can yes. perhaps use or prescribe to our patients? Because without salt, food is not palatable. And my patient is going to hate me if I tell them not to take salt. So Yes. No, no, great questions, mother. I'll start off with you with your last question regarding salt alternatives. So you do get uh, a, a, an assault alternative called um, half and half. I don't know, um, it's essentially 50% sodium chloride and 50% potassium chloride. And, and as you saw there, the more potassium you consume, the better mm. it is for blood pressure. Our kidneys yeah. are actually made to um, deal with potassium better compared to dealing with sodium. Yeah, uh, and it may be an evolutionary thing, but when when salt was scarce many many centuries ago, when salt was a scarce entity, and and people consume salt, the kidneys evolved in such a way to avidly reabsorb sodium. Mm -hmm. So 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 um, that is why our kidneys are so excellent at retaining salt. So. I, if, if it's possible, I usually recommend so-called half and half salt. Another alternative is um, lemon juice as an alternative to using sodium for, for, mm. for taste. The only thing with the half and half, you must ensure 
that kidney function is yeah. is is good because there yeah. is the risk for the development of hyperkalemia, particularly if patients are using uh, drugs like ACE inhibitors and so forth. Uh, your, your first question regarding are there any prerequisites before you do the aldorenin level? All your antihypertensives, or most of them, may have some kind of effect on your aldorenin. For example, a thiazide diuretic, when it causes hypovolemia, will activate the renin angiotensin system, aldosterone mm -hmm. system, and therefore may falsely elevate the aldo and the renin. Um, patients who are using beta blockers, beta blockers inhibit renin secretion. ACE inhibitors, of course, will have an effect on the renin and aldo by increasing renin and suppressing aldosterone. Um, as same with an angiotensin receptor blocker. So, and then the most important um, drug that has an effect on this is spironolactone. So, what do I do? I don't, you can't stop all the patient's antihypertensives when you do these tests. Yeah, yeah, if yeah, the patient, yeah. if I'm about to start a patient on spironolactone and I do have a concern for primary hyperaldosteronism, I actually do the tests before I start the patient on, on spironolactone. However, if the patient is, has, is, has already, is already established on spironolactone, you actually have to stop the agent wait six weeks and then perform the aldorenin levels before you can actually, so so you you unfortunately will have to stop it and wait six weeks. Mm -hmm. The other mm -hmm. important thing is if the patient has hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, it can mm -hmm. have an effect on aldosterone levels. In yeah. fact, but, uh, um, hypokalemia will inhibit aldosterone secretion and hyperkalemia will increase aldosterone. So you have to get the yeah. potassium normal before. That said, mm -hmm. I don't stop the ACE inhibitor and I don't stop the ARB if the patient is, or, or is using those drugs. And the reason is, if the ALDO, if the renin and ALDO ratio comes back and the renin is still suppressed, despite the use of an yeah. ACE inhibitor, it increases mm -hmm. the specificity of the test and mm -hmm. makes the chances of cons much more likely. Thank you so much. Okay, so I see there are a lot of questions. Um, if you don't mind, we'll start with them. So the first question is, um, do these studies, so it's referring to the studies that you presented uh, on manual versus automated devices, yes. indicate, indicate which is the correct blood pressure. So manual versus automated, which is the correct blood pressure? Could it be interpreted that the electronic devices are underestimating versus manual measurement? So that's the so question. The, the BP2 blood pressure cups are, are standardized and has been compared to so-called gold standard, which is 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So yeah. not unfortunately, not all devices are actually standardized according mm -hmm. to gold standard. There's only a, mm -hmm. a handful of manufacturers that actually yeah. go the way, go all the way to standardize, to validate the measurements according to gold standard. Yeah. So yes, yeah. it is possible that if your, if your uh, automated machine hasn't been standardized and validated, it may be mm -hmm. under or overestimating as well. Mm -hmm. But um, in, in most of the studies, they either use the so-called BP2 machine, mm -hmm. which um, has been validated uh, uh, to gold standard, as well as another, um, uh, uh, make that I recommend is Omron. So Omron yeah. is, a, is a blood, is, is, or you know, you can buy these things at your local pharmacy. It's yes. been validated to, to gold mm -hmm. standard. And in my right. clinic, I actually use an Omron machine. So right. yes, it right. is possible, but if you're using the correct devices that has been validated, it should be accurate. Mm -hmm. Got you, thank you so much. Because in the market, we have a lot of um, EP machines, including Chinese machines. So, yes. you know, it tends to kind of cause a lot of conflicting ideas. Of the patient may be manage, measuring it at home and it may be showing the wrong reading when it comes to refills. Yes. The blood pressure is completely different. So it's it's something that uh, is uh, not very readily uh, understood why that happens. And I think of this course. is one thing that uh, you mentioned about standardization, which not all the companies do because it's very That's expensive, right. I would assume. 
Right. So uh, the next question is um, the these measurements, so basically the quantification of salt, salt, oil, etc., are very complicated for patients to understand. And I think that's the reason why you mentioned, you know, half a teaspoon of salt it rather is. than 1.5, you know, uh, 1,500 grams of uh, milligrams of salt. So when giving health education, what is the easiest and simplest technique you would advise a patient to measure these food ingredients to achieve the desired goals? I, it's it's very difficult to be able to explain to patients what 2,300 milligrams of sodium is. And like I said, um, a lip, they most people, even people who with low levels of education, will understand what the level level teaspoon is. And sometimes I even in my clinic go fetch a level teaspoon to show them what it looks right. like. Right. right. Okay. Right. Um, with regards to foods to consume, because you really have to make it practical for the patient. You can't tell them eat this, don't eat that. They they don't mm. understand. And um, I usually tell patients, when you enter the shopping, um, you know, the, the grocery store, the healthy foods are in the perimeter of the, of the, of the, of the store, the grocery store, yeah. and all the processed foods are in the aisles. So when you, right. when you buy food, you buy, yeah. you shop along the, out the, the perimeter of the store, because that is where right. all the fresh fruit and vegetables are. All mm. the fresh produce is there. Right. All the right. processed foods is in the center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I Understood. do talk to them about bread consumption because as I yeah. mentioned in South Africa, that is a big source of salt. Any comment on the circadian cycles in relation to the timing of dosing of antihypertensives? A good question. Um, so there were studies that were done looking at um, maybe taking one of your end of the antihypertensives in the evening. Um, mm -hmm. There was a randomized control trial looking at using your calcium channel blocker, taking the calcium channel blocker 10 o'clock in the evening. And, and this study did show a reduction in um, a 50% reduction in stroke rates. Mm. And what is thought, how this was thought uh, to what, what may ha be happening is hypertensive patients also have so they are so-called non-dippers. In other words, yeah. when we do 24-hour blood pressure, your blood pressure should drop by more than 10% at night when you are asleep. But patients who are hypertensives, actually their blood pressures remain constant throughout the night. It doesn't drop or in fact, you mm. get something called reverse dipping where the blood pressure actually rises that night. So mm -hmm. in theory, if you take a blood pressure tablet in the evening, it mm -hmm. will actually prevent um, the reverse dipping or non dipper status, reducing mm -hmm. your risk for cardiovascular events. And also remember, most cardiovascular events, strokes and myocardial infarctions occur in the early hours of the morning when patients are asleep. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is evidence that taking one of your antihypertensives in the evening may improve outcomes. How does one titrate medication in resistant hypertension? So, so as I, I, I've shown you earlier, firstly, you shouldn't waste time titrating medication um, mm. because the 80% the of the antihypertensive effect is already on half the dose, number one. Mm. But the definition of resistant hypertension is maximally tolerated doses. So that may be five milligrams of, um, of enalapril a daily for one patient. And then for another patient, it may be 10 milligrams twice a day. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on, on, on um, maximally tolerated doses. So it depends on you and how often you can see the patient and titrate up medication after you've excluded other causes for so-called pseudo resistance. I think it, it, it's very important to note that when we have busy clinics, we tend to, to the patient literally walks into your room, the blood pressure, the patient hasn't even sat yet, but the blood pressure cuff yeah. is on the arm and mm -hmm. we are chatting to the patient while pumping the cuff up. Yes. You need to first confirm that the blood pressure is truly raised before you start 
adding more medication. The the we need to take more blood pressures. It's like it's like a diabetic who comes into your mm. clinic. Mm. The sugar at that clinic visit is 15, but the HbA1c is 5%. Mm. Do you treat the patient? No. Because mm. it's we're not gonna treat the patient on a once of sugar of 15 when we know yeah. the HbA1c is excellent. It's the mm. same for blood pressure. One mm. blood pressure and adjusting medication based on a single blood pressure is dangerous. Right. And I've seen patients come in with severe mm. hypotension because mm. they suddenly become compliant on the medication yeah. uh, and they start and you add more medication and then mm. they actually develop severe syncope and postural hypotension and all these things. Thank you so much, Yazid, uh, for that. Um, and it does tend to happen that way. Um, I've noticed that with my practice as well, uh, that uh, when the patient comes to my office, they've sat for some time, kind of, you know, relaxed, and then the blood pressure on the nursing record is high. But then after I've spoken to them and they've yeah, come down, I take the blood pressure again, and the blood pressure is actually 10, 15 millimeters lesser, you know, so it, it does it happen. And I, I feel like this is something that we should be fairly well aware of before adding medication, as you correctly um, I agree. Why is the target systolic blood pressure still 140, whereas the sprint child showed a lower target is associated with better outcomes without significant adverse effects? Remember, the, the getting those targets are, are not easy. In South Africa, we actually decided to keep the target under 140 because it was, it's already difficult to get the patient down to that level. Yeah. That's it. In the sprint trial, there were some side effects. Patients mm. did, uh, did develop more syncope. They did mm. have hyperkalemia and acute kidney injury were the, were the three most common side effects in the group randomized to uh, um, systolics of 120. Mm. Uh, in the past, or even some, I do sometimes recommend, especially in patients with CKD, that the lower you can get the blood pressure, the blood better. And one of my previous mentors, Professor Rafik Musa, used to say, he used to say that if the patient can stand up without getting dizzy and the blood pressure is 100 over 60, then you leave it like that. Right. So I think when you need to individualize. You, you, there are certain patients where you can go lower, and then there are others where we need to be a bit more. Um, less tight with the blood pressure, especially if, for example, CKD patients where acute kidney injury with lower blood pressures is a risk. Yeah. There is sea salt or potassium salt. Is that a good alternative? Uh, no, it doesn't matter. Salt is salt. Right. So, um, uh, uh, by the way, there's this pink Himalayan shot salt. Yes. It's salt. Right. It's not healthier than other salt. So right. uh, don't be fooled. There'll be people that want uh, to sell patients these pink Himalayan salt. Uh, right. <laughs> it's salt. Sodium chloride is sodium chloride, whether it's pink, right. green, yellow, whatever. Right, right. Got it. Got it. So half and half is actually the best. Uh, half best and half is the way to go. Best yeah. is, like I said, uh, lemon. A, lemon, a lemon juice for some flavor. Yeah. Right. right. Okay, so um, it says here, uh, my question is on CKD patient who have resistant hypertension and have exhausted all drugs, the ACE, ARBs, CCBs, and thiazide, and also with regards to additional spironolactum. How do we deal with the hyperkalemia issues? Okay, so hyperkalemia is, uh, um, firstly, you must make sure that in your outpatient setting in CKD patients, that the that the the sample is taken correctly. Mm. Um, just to let you know, there was a study done in a urology clinic in patients who had uh, CKD, and they uh, they had an intervention in the study. So what happened was they found that sixteen percent of patients in this cl urology clinic had so called pseudo hypokalemia. Okay, then they did a had they had a phlebotomy um, intervention, and they actually found that nurses were taught how to correctly draw um, blood samples, not using tourniquets, not fist clenching, not tapping on the veins so that it stands out, 
and they found that pseudo-hypokalemia in patients with CKD dropped to 3%. So number one, first exclude pseudo-hypokalemia. In a patient who develops hypokalemia despite um, the, the use of antihypertensives at maximum, unfortunately, you will have to address multiple things. One is it's recommended that you actually reduce the antihypertensive, the, the, the ACE inhibitor dose. Right. Or the ARB dose. The spironolactone may need to be stopped completely. And you will unfortunately mm -hmm. need to go with alternative drugs. In our right. setting, we tend to um, use minoxidil as, as an alternative in order to, yeah. to, to reduce blood pressure. So, mm -hmm. we, and we usually use minoxidil in combination with a beta blocker and a diuretic because of the side effects that, that, that usually develops edema and um, mm -hmm. reflex tachycardia. So with, with, with hypokalemia in the outpatient setting, you have to reduce the dose. If blood pressure is still not a target, you unfortunately have to reduce the dose. You need to address diet and you need to initiate alternative antihypertensives, which do not have an effect on the potassium concentration. But very importantly, as I said, rule out pseudo-hypokalemia. It's, it's not, I don't think people appreciate pseudo-hypokalemia. Yeah. In, we've re we're busy, we've got a paper that's currently under peer review, looking at unexplained hyperkalemia in hospitalized patients. And we found that out of, a, out of a total study population of 184, nearly 10% of patients had pseudo hyperkalemia. Thank you so much, uh, Azir, for that. The other question is, is the ENEC mutation common in other parts of Africa? I'm not sure, unfortunately. This, this, uh, the reason the ENAC mutation was so high in that study of uh, Shiraz Musa is because mm -hmm. Erika Jones, who um, works at Kroatiske Hospital, performed a PhD on that ENAC yeah. mutation. Right. So it, it, there's a bias towards finding the mutation at that hospital. That is why it was so high. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what the prevalence would be like in other parts of Africa. We this was specifically a study performed in Cape Town in in the hypertension clinic at Kroatiske Hospital. So the it is a bias. The number is right. is 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 high because they specifically we do going to look for that mutation. Right, right, and probably the the logistics of doing the the uh, mutation analysis may also be something that is not available. That's right uh, throughout uh, Africa. Uh, so that's it right. may be so, a bit So that's it. If you if you find a patient who has a low renin and aldo. Part of the differential diagnosis for low renin and low aldo is little syndrome. Right. The absence of licorice intake, Cushing syndrome, mm. and some mm. other rare diseases such as um, the beta, the 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase deficiency. Those are rare mm -hmm. things in kids. So, yeah. By default, I almost always put when 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 the renin and aldo is low and the patient not using using licorice, I usually in a, um, I would consider using a myeloride as the antihypertensive. How about the mobile apps that detect blood pressure? Um, I think the smartwatches can patients rely on this? I don't think I'm, it's I'm, something that we should, but you can go uh, ahead, uh, Yazid. Unfortunately, I can't answer that. I've got no experience with these mobile apps. You yeah. know, these things on the new kids on the block. I guess yeah. it would be a good screening thing to do. And if mm. the patient, if it is elevated, that the patient uh, goes to the cl nearest clinic or doctor to have it formally tested. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there is usually a disclaimer that says that this is not a substitute for a medical device or medical... Uh, no, they have to say that. are concerned... Yeah, and then you yeah. have to kind of come in. Yeah. yeah. After how long duration of using the the three drugs, so ACE, thiazide, calcium channel blocker, uh, a clinician can diagnose resistant hypertension. So, mm -hmm. meaning how long duration that the patient has used these drugs, can you diagnose resistant? Yes, hypertension? I hear you. So, so there's no there's no timeline. If right. the if you are certain that it's true resistant hypertension after you've excluded all the the causes of pseudo-resistant hypertension. You can diagnose the patient um, after one month, two months, whatever the, the case may be. That said, mm. blood pressure reduction 
is a process. It's not mm. an immediate effect. So in mm. other words, I, if you look at that study that I showed you that was performed in Africa um, with, with the three arms, yeah. you will yep. notice there was a continual reduction in blood pressure over the six-month period. It didn't yeah. go all the way down to its nadir from the get-go. Mm. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. continuous. So you do have to give the blood pressure tablet some time to take effect mm. before you mm. um, decide to, to diagnose true resistant hypertension after you've excluded yeah. all those pseudo things. How yeah. long that time is, unfortunately, I can't, I can't tell you. Right, right. Uh, so one one need, thing that you yeah. may then want to consider is um, over this whatever period of time you decide to uh, monitor the patient, if there's ongoing target organ damage, hmm. then probably the resistant hypertension is not, or the hypertension is not being managed properly. So you probably have to individualize uh, your patient and decide on you know uh, what the risks are for this yeah. patient and up the treatment yeah. accordingly. All right. Um, okay. Uh, what's the preferred medication in patients with diastolic blood pressures? Example, blood pressure of 140 by 100. Sorry, can you just repeat that so, question? Master? So the, the question is, what is the preferred medication in patients with high diastolic blood pressures? So for example, the blood pressure of about 140 by 100. What is the so, preferred medication? So it doesn't matter um, mm -hmm. whether the patient has systolic hypertension or diastolic hypertension only, it doesn't matter. You can use, as I've shown in the, in the graph, it, you, in the picture, you can use an enalapril or ACE, uh, thiazide or thiazide like or calcium channel blocker. That said, probably a calcium channel blocker is best for, for diastolic hypertension. Uh, what are your comments on combination or polypharmacy? So atenolol plus amlodipine, ARB plus hydrochlorothiazide and even triple combination. So these are really the um, combination drugs are really the best. And, and there's lots mm -hmm. of studies to show that morbidity, cardiovascular morbidity and mortality is reduced when, used, when using combination drugs. Um, that's it. There are studies to show that longer acting agents that work for 24 hours are superior to drugs where you need to take it twice a day. Mm -hmm. So for example, enalapril, which is usually prescribed twice a day, mm -hmm. but endopril is superior. So, right. so drugs right. that losartan, which is taken once a day, is yeah. the, the drug of choice. It just has a better control over the blood pressure over a 24 hour period compared to yeah. drugs where you need to take it twice a day. But if you have the luxury and your patient can afford single drug combinations, that should be your first line. Okay. Um, is it safe to administer erythropoietin injection to patients with a post-dialysis hypertension with a systolic blood pressure of more than 170 millimeters of mercury? Yes, no, it is. I actually um, did a study here in Cape Town where we looked at so-called intradialytic hypertension, which is yes. really, even if it goes up off, soon after the dialysis session is still regarded as intradialytic. Um, yeah. And in fact, blood pressure can go up, up to 12 hours after you've stopped dialysis. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and in our study, we did look at the erythropoietin and its effect yeah. on, on, on um, intradialytic hypertension. And, and we could not find any uh, signal that erythropoietin used in our patients uh, yeah. contributed to, um, to, to the blood pressure. The thing, the thing that contributed to the blood pressure was volume. And we measured yeah. volume using bioimpedance. Yes. If I understood correctly, what the question is asking, if I understood correctly, in pathway two, spironolactone was the fourth drug to be added. So in black Africans on hydrochlorothiazide and a calcium channel blocker, what would be the best third drug before adding spironolactone? So, so in black patients on a thiazide and calcium channel blocker? Yes. What would be the third agent to add? ACE inhibitors. Right. So, okay. so despite popular belief, um, the, there was the ASK trial 
I don't know if you yes. are familiar with the ASTRAL, the African American study on kidney disease and hypertension. It was done yeah. in America, though, uh, on, yeah. on African Americans. And one of the myths that were um, uh, removed was that ACE inhibitors are actually effective in treating blood pressure in, mm. in African Americans with CKD and hypertension. So, yeah. so uh, ACE inhibitors are, as, as that triangle I showed you, those are the three yeah. drugs. If the patient is using any other two combinations, then you'll add mm -hmm. the third drug, which, which you haven't used it. In this case, in the question, it would be an ACE or an yeah. ARP. What is the best drug for isolated systolic hypertension? And how low can one go on the diastolic? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, so again, you, I, I've used calcium channel blockers in, in, um, for isolated systolic hypertension. Um, mm -hmm. Some people recommend that you shouldn't target low blood pressures um, like less than 130, 140. In fact, the target range for some patients in the elderly is yep. uh, not to go under 150 or, or 150 mm -hmm. should be the target. And yep. the reason is because of the stiffening of the blood vessels, with, uh, which results in the isolated systolic hypertension. So the, and as you saw in that diagram about the how common hypertension is, as we get older, hypertension increases and, and it usually starts with as diastolic hypertension. And then as we get older, it converts to systolic hypertension and the diastolic actually decreases and patients have a so-called wide pulse pressure. Mm -hmm. So um, in the very elderly, it is some experts recommend not dropping the systolic blood pressure under 150. 150 should be the target rather than 140. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. Uh, maybe last two questions. Um, how do I advise my hypertensive patient who is sweating profusely regarding salt intake. So it seems like- Are you sweating patient, profusely? As in, I think it's probably regarding weather and humidity, if patients sweat. Uh, so it says, how do I advise my hypertensive patient who is sweating profusely regarding his salt intake? So ideally you would like to okay. reduce the salt intake, no, but no, good, because he's sweating, yeah. No, 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 good question. And Mazar, you should know the answer to this one. Yeah, um, I kind of smiled salt, when, I, when, I, when sweet, I read that, yeah. Yes, sweet is actually not salty, okay? I think that's very important. So it doesn't matter whether it's a high uh, humidity or high temperatures and the patient sweats a lot. Sweet is not salty. It tastes salty, yes, but it's not salty. What happens is sweet is actually hypotonic. It has very low sodium concentrations, like 30 millimoles per liter. Okay, what happens when we sweat is the, this hypotonic solution comes out of the skin. And what happens is the, the water component of sweat evaporates and the salt mm. remains. And when you yeah. lick it, it tastes salty, but it's yeah. actually not salty in terms of its concentrations. It wouldn't yeah. make sense to sweat out your salt mm. in high concentrations because what would happen is we would, us as a human race, we would have all died out millions of years ago because we would all go into hypovolemic shock and die. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. despite popular belief, sweet is hypotonic. It's got very, very low sodium concentrations and mm. it only tastes salty because after the water evaporates, the concentration yeah. increases. Yes, understood. Understood. So you can actually tell your patient to take low salt because uh, you want to control the blood pressure. So that is an answer to, to the question. Um, maybe one last question. Yeah. When exactly hydralazine or prazosin should be used? Sure. I haven't used prazosin in decades, but yeah. not because uh, I don't like it. It's mainly because we've, we've uh, replaced it with doxazosin. As a yeah. as an alpha one antagonist, so yeah, yeah. We, I do use um, doxazosin, and and that is something to consider as a fifth line or sixth line 
if the patient after you've used your other three and the and the inspire on a lactone. Yeah. Hydralazine as well, that's something that to, to consider lower down the line. But as mm -hmm. I've mentioned earlier, it is uncommon yeah. that you need four or five or six drugs. Mm -hmm. Patients are not taking the medication when you are using those type of drugs, when you're using four yeah. or five, six drugs. Yeah. It is really uncommon, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. And the first yeah. thing I go yeah. and look for is adherence. In fact, I, mm -hmm. I do sometimes admit the patients and do directly observe therapy. Yeah. And I add the patient's medications. Normal, I don't change the medications. I give them mm -hmm. what they are normally taking. And what do you think yeah. happens in the ward? Their blood pressures drop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, sometimes yeah. I have to stop some of the medication because it drops too yeah. much. Yeah. And then I discharge the patient from my clinic because mm -hmm. um, they're wasting their time and my time. Understood. Understood. So once once you start putting patients on more than three drugs, you need to reconsider are the Great. patients actually taking. I mean, look at that sprint trial. The yes. intensive group would achieve a of 120 were using three drugs. Yes, correct. 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 So we should we should be we should be careful uh, with our patients. Maybe one last question and then we close. And this is from my side. Yes. Um, is there um is there a difference between using amlodipine and nifedipine uh, as the preferred uh, calcium channel blocker? So when would we use which one? Because both of them are calcium channel blockers. Yeah. Yes. No. No. You. No. Good question, Mazid. You know what I'm going to say. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I it's don't for the use... benefit of the of the yes. participants. Yeah. I don't use amlodipine for hypertensive um, emergencies, like yeah. malignant hypertension, where there's acute target organ damage and where we need to get the blood pressure down within hours. Mm. Amlodipine, I like, there's a term that I use, I call it amslodipine. Mm. Um, it actually takes too long in terms of mm. reducing blood pressure in the... Yeah emergency situation in like malignant hypertension the reason yeah. i'm telling you this is there were studies done in the 90s when amlodipine was launched they used normal tensive patients mm. and they um, gave them 15 milligrams of amlodipine twice a day right and they took the sorry not sorry they, they took 15 milligrams of amlodipine which is much more than what we normally recommend. And the blood pressures were taken twice a day and they did blood samples and urine samples in order to look at pharmacokinetics. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that after one week of using 15 milligrams in normal tens of individuals, the blood pressures mm -hmm. only started to decrease after the seventh day. Yeah. So the, I do not use amlodipine as an emergen, emergency drug in patients with a hypertensive emergency, I do not recommend it. Like I said, I call it amslodipine because it takes too long. And in yeah. these situations, I would consider using nifedipine, Excel, yeah. um, or, or I would, and or um, ACE inhibitors and diuretics and all the other drugs that have a more rapid onset of action. Amlodipine is an excellent outpatient drug. Mm -hmm. It has an excellent pharmacokinetic profile for outpatient management of hypertension, but not in the acute hypertensive emergency situation. Thank you so much, um, Yazid, for your time. Uh, we're way over time and uh, we appreciate you presenting uh, this topic. That is something that I feel is not very well understood, or if it is, then we're not very faithful to our patients with treatment. So I think it made very easy for people to understand in the simplistic way that you presented and uh, took your time to answer a multitude of questions. Uh, and there are still questions coming in, but in uh, with respect to time, uh, we will end it here. And I would like to thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Lloyd, I uh, would like to thank you so much and we would like you to come through again uh, for any other topic of your choice. Please just let us know when you are free. And we'll make uh, make it a, a point to get give you the platform again. Thank you so much, and uh, have a good night. Thank you, Mazza. Thank you for the invitation.